Welcome to episode three of season two of London Lights. I am just over the moon today to have as my guest a legendary drummer, Graham Lear, born in London, uh, London England, uh, Plymouth, England to be exact, but raised in London, Ontario. And uh, Graham, we are so happy to have you on the program. Welcome to London Lights. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. You certainly do qualify as a London light. In episode one of this season, I had Mario Cercelli of the London Music Hall of Fame on the program. Mm -hmm. And I challenged him to name the top 10 greatest musical acts out of London, Ontario. Suffice it to say, as I recall, you came in as number one. He had glowing praise for you. Uh, I think you had a chance to see the episode, didn't you? I did, yes, yeah. And it's very nice to see Mario yeah, getting his due, so to speak. Right. And uh, yeah, he's been a great uh, promoter of, of mine uh, since I've met him, really. He's a great guy, and he, he did a great uh, show on the program. So listen, I want to just start. Bear with me. I'm going to do a little bio of yourself. I know you don't like to toot your own horn, but there's lots to toot about you as a drummer, and uh, we're very proud of you as uh, Londoners. So Graham, you were born in 1949. English yes. born, but you came to London, Ontario, Canada with your family at a yes. very young mm -hmm. age. Yes. You're uh, known as a Canadian rock drummer, best known for your time with Gino Vanelli, 13 years with Santana, and Ario Speedwagon, as well as Paul Anka. Uh -huh. uh, your family yeah. moved here when you were very young. You began your professional career at the age of 13 with the London, Ontario Symphony Orchestra. During your teenage years, you practiced, played, and toured with several bands in Canada and in the United States, probably all over the world. Gino Vanelli was the first major recording act that you worked with. You recognized your talents. You recorded with him on some important work. You then went on to tour with him. Uh, I know you're going to talk to me about how you made the connection with Santana. Bill Graham was searching right. for you for uh, quite a while and finally got a hold of you. I'm sure yes. you'll fill us in on the details. Did work with Santana 13 years, then uh, Ario Speedwagon, Saga, Paul Anka. You worked with some of the greats, Henry Mancini, Dominic Triano, uh, David Foster, uh, to name but a few. So far, have I got most of that right? Yes. Now, here's mm -hmm. the part I really like. This kind of focuses on London, Ontario. And I know uh, there's lots to talk about when it involves you and your talent and your work. But the unique thing about this program is we like to toot the horn of Londoners. So I'm hoping exactly. to get a good, a good London background. So. You. Here's the thing. You began drumming at age eight. I love this. Auditioning for the Police Boy Concert Band of London, Ontario. I'm wondering if I saw you in the Santa Claus Parade or something. Well, you may have back in the day. I don't have any photos from then. I wish I had. There's uh, one of me in uh, uniform floating around somewhere, but I was proud to wear that uniform. It was part of the East, I think the East Lions concert band directed by A.C. Robinson, I think was the director. And I got involved in that. And uh, yeah, we marched in the Santa Claus Parade for a, a good few years in a row there, I think. That is fantastic. So I saw you before yeah. the, the world discovered you because I was always at the Santa Claus Parade. Uh, okay, to yeah. Complete this up, to wrap up this intro, in 1974, you moved mm -hmm. to Los Angeles with Canadian singer Gino Vanelli, during which time the Grammy-nominated Powerful People and Storm at Sunsup, Sunup was recorded, produced by A&M Records icon Herb Alpert, Herb Alpert. Significantly, drumming legend Buddy Rich covered two tracks from those sessions, Storm at Sunup and Love Me Now, for his Speak No Evil album. The critically acclaimed Vanello recording, Just to the Gemini, followed, engineered by, get this, Jeff Emmerich at Air Studios UK, United Kingdom. I read his book about the Beatles and his work with them. I was totally blown away. Suffice it to say, you've rubbed shoulders with some of the greats. Yeah, I've been very fortunate in my time, that's for sure. Londoners should be blown away by your accomplishments. And uh, we all want to hear the details of that, especially your start in London, Ontario. So why don't you fill us in? How did that happen? Well, my sister played the accordion, and uh, she was three years older, is three years older than me. And uh, but my family wasn't particularly musical. My parents weren't, but my dad thought I should start an instrument, and he marched me down to the uh, 
police boys band and they were rehearsing in outside, I guess summertime outside in the back section of the old police station downtown off of Talbot and uh, in the garage at the back. And I auditioned and they handed me a pair of drumsticks and said, go back there. And they gave me a practice pad and I went back there and tapped away with the, some of the other guys that were there. And then uh, my dad took me for private lessons with Don Johnson and I started into it, you know. Uh, pretty regularly it was fun did you have an inkling uh, that you wanted to be a drummer or was it kind of hey dad whatever you think we should do let's go for it no didn't really have an inkling about drums per se then you know I think my dad was just trying to see if I had what abilities were where and they decided I had an aptitude for rhythm and uh, Martin Bounty did the test with me I remember and Joe George I think was there and uh, yeah ran through the test and they said handed me a pair of sticks I loved it. They handed me a pair of sticks in the pad and I went, oh, cool. This, yeah. this might seem like a dumb question, but uh, I think I know what the answer is going to be. You're drumming for this police band at the age of eight. And yeah. is that something that starts developing your skills at that point on? Or is that kind of a throwaway thing? No, you start developing right then. And they, they gave us a book, a basic book, you know, a rudimental book and give it some beginning, you know, patterns and things. And, uh, but really what helped me was taking private lessons along with that, with Don. It was a, a very astute uh, assumption of my dad to, to say, well, let's get you a weekly lesson and you have to practice a half an hour a day. And he was rigid about that. And uh, so that was my routine cool. starting then. Yeah. And uh, when did you get your first drum set? Were you a young boy, a teenager? What's the story on that? Well, it's a bit of a story, but uh, long story short, uh, we pieced it together because my dad was not making a ton of money, and he also wasn't quite sure whether a, a full drum set was expensive, and he wanted to get a good quality one, like probably a Ludwig, which was the most popular at the time because Ringo played it. Oh, yes. And uh, they were very popular, but quite expensive, and so we decided, okay, we're going to get that set, but we're going to piece it together over time. So we started with a snare, and I got a good snare, a Ludwig snare. And I played only on snare for quite a long time because really that was all I was required to do back in the beginning. I was playing concert band and, and marching and we only played snare. So I was concentrating on the rudiments and just hand technique and snare. And you know, looking back on that was a, the best start I could have had because I developed that basis before I went on to independence with the other limbs and maybe might have pushed it too soon too fast you know whatever and uh so i didn't really get my first drum set completed until age 14. wow at one point there i didn't have a bass drum and don johnson my teacher wanted me to move me to bass drum he said you're doing well let's put your right foot into this and then uh but we didn't have one and my dad made a wooden upright kind of contraption that uh, that would work and we had a, an old used pedal and i banged away on that pedal for quite a while before I got a bass drum. Yeah. What I love about your story, and, and we hear this with a lot of successful people, that their parents mm -hmm. are very involved and very supportive in what they're yes. doing. And I, I just see your dad moving you along here every step of the way. I just think that's fantastic. Yeah, absolutely right. And I couldn't drive in those days, so he drove me to all the rehearsals. You know, and he worked uh, hard and as a painter for the school board. And he, uh, he came home after work, and oftentimes we barely had time to eat, and it was off to a rehearsal. Wow. You know, sometimes two, three times a week through the rehearsals. Yeah. At wow. least. So age yeah. 13 now, they say you start your professional career at that point. You're with the London Symphony Orchestra. How does that come about? And was it unusual for them to pick someone that's 13? Well, they didn't really pick me. I mean, I just started by, by in the network of the local percussionists that were working, uh, especially Bob Hughes at uh, Western University back then. He was on in the percussion ensemble. In fact, I think he led it. And... Um, they were they were looking for fill-ins uh, here and there because it wasn't a full professional orchestra. And by the way, it started with the junior symphony and then did some sessions with the with the full symphony and, um, and but not until later years. So. Just for the benefit of Londoners who are tuning in, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where were you living? What part of London were you in during these early years? I was living in the East End uh, around the Waybell um, Dundas area. No, sorry, Waybell uh, uh, Winnipeg street area well and um, i'm proud to not say not too far we, from clark road right and i'm proud to say we both went to prince charles for a short time wonderful yes yes 
And, and the, the, I moved around uh, public schools, I think three times there because that East End was developing so quickly. But I do know that I ended up at Churchill, I think from grades four through eight. Mm. And that was the closest school, I believe. That was kind of up off of Wayville area up, uh, up there too, but that was the closest to Clark Road. And then I guess I ended up going to Clark Road. Mario Cercelli was telling us about a photograph that he has in the London mm -hmm. Music Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. With a band, uh, I think it's called King Lear and uh, his <laughs> troupe or something. King Lear and the Playwrights. Yes, that's oh, the wow. play there, right? Was the King Lear and the Playwrights. Well, yeah. I haven't seen the photo, but he describes it as here's this young guy, Graham Lear, with all these adult musicians. And Graham's uh, so good that he's leading the band you know, rhythm rhythmically. And, uh, and you guys were forced to be reckoned with at that early age of 14. Well, I was lucky to get involved in that because they asked me to do it. And a lot of them, like you said, the musicians were older and they were very influenced by the Memphis R&B that they were listening. And that was, I didn't know anybody who listened to that kind of music like Booker T and the MGs and everybody. And uh, so they were starting to try to play some of those things old Ray Charles tracks that were, you know, even beyond me at my young age. I didn't, didn't know about Ray Charles and we were, we were playing this stuff and it was challenging for me to try and learn it. And in fact, I just sort of, Back in those days, 14, 15 years old, I was still kind of faking my way through playing that stuff because it wasn't like I sat around in my, my basement like we have the facilities today where I could just put on headphones and wail away to that stuff. I just didn't have that opportunity. So it was trial by error, and uh, but their influence was really good um, to, to get me to listen to that music. And, and, you know, I play it to this day. Well, I know you got into a band then, the lo local London band called Natural Gas, and you had... Uh... Uh, some experience with them uh, but we're going to take a commercial break here in a minute and then I want to talk about you hitting the big time for lack of a better word uh, starting out with Gino Vanelli one of my favorite bands from the 70s uh, I understand you were the drummer on People Gotta Move yes that is true I was a yeah. guitar player but I always remember when that song came on the radio I'm like that drummer blows my mind the intro to that song on drums, just, just fantastic. I want to talk well, about you. your rise, uh, but we're going to take this commercial break, and then we'll be right back, the viewers, with Graham Lear, uh, legendary London drummer. Uh, stay with us. All right, Dan Mailer here with London Lights. And again, I'm just tickled to have as our guest today, Graham Lear, legendary, iconic drummer from Canada, from London, Ontario. All right, I want to talk about your rise now. We've heard about your London background, Graham. One of the albums in my collection, let me just show it to you. Ah. I can get this right. <laughs> Nino Vanelli. We've already Whoa. mentioned the people got to move. There's a little photograph in the middle here. Not sure if that's showing up, but that well, guy that, looks suspiciously like Graham Lear. Uh, yeah, a little bit, you know, if you can see a face <laughs> through the hair. Um, and that was my, <laughs> that was why I had that reaction. Because I knew you were going to, you know, is he going to open it up? Uh oh, he did. Yeah. Yeah, oh, it's yeah. one of those things, you know, I went through a period there maybe for a good couple of years. Somebody, well, actually, when I first joined Gino, just kept growing my hair and I just, you know, I probably should have cut it at that point. And I went, oh, what the heck, we're going to be in London, England. I just leave it long, you know, maybe not such a good idea looking back on it, but hey, you know. Well, tell me, tell me about the connection with Gino Vanelli. So we've heard about mm -hmm. what you were doing in London. You're in some bands here, but of course, not huge bands. You're having some success. You're being recognized as being a very talented drummer. And I understand you end up going to Montreal. What happens there? Well, I went down there playing with George Oliver. Um, was not called Natural Gas. Natural Gas had split up at that point and George continued on as a, as a single performer and he would you know, pick, pick different musicians to back him out of Toronto. And I happened to be on that one. Went down there for I think a, a week or something. At, we were playing a, an old club called Your, Your Father's Mustache, I think across from the old Montreal Forum. And uh, we're playing there one night, and uh, the whole Vanelli family came in. Mr. Vanelli, the father, uh, Gino and Joe, and Ross, the younger brother, as well. So the four of them, I think, yes, four of them came in. Watched a set, uh, asked me to come over after. I, I had heard about them, but never met them through some other friends in Montreal that I worked with. 
And uh, we sat down and they said, uh, well, we did this first record with a and we were signed to AM Records, et cetera, and gave me the background, which sounded fantastic because not everybody could say that, you know, and especially in those years. And uh, they said, well, come out to our, um, our basement in, uh, at the house and uh, here we'll play what we did and uh, tell you where we want to go. And they said, well, we want to put a band together. Gino wants to get off the drums. He was a drummer originally, he sang and played drums in bands around Montreal, but he wanted to get out front and sing and be an artist on his own right. And uh, they played everything and I was, I was really impressed with their first album. And uh, yeah, some Crazy really, Life, really which nice. was he and, his, and Joe did together, just the both of them played every instrument. Wow. Joe, these, obviously, these, they were obviously so very talented and music was original. And uh, I went, well, you know, you, uh, some things you stare it in the face, you don't have to think about it all that long. And I, and I didn't. And, uh, you know, so my, my, uh, my wife at the time moved in to their basement and I moved into their basement and uh, we lived there in their apartment. They had an apartment in their basement in Montreal East. We lived there for six months. Well, uh, it's, uh, it's a great story. And uh, so begins the rise. Yeah. Three years with Gino Vanelli, right? Yeah, yeah, I did three, three yeah, the fall of 76, I, I finished with them, yeah. I went to Santana. Uh -huh. and, and, and again, that great song, People Gotta Move, it just uh, Oh, thank you. Every... I could still listen to that intro, like you mentioned the intro before. And oh. Yeah, you know, it, it's fun. I worked on that with Gino, because Gino's a drummer, too. So we were, it turned out that we worked hand-in-hand hand quite well, because I had a little bit more technique and background than he did, but he had more of a concept of, of what... The drums probably in some simpler ways needed to, to be played to just uh, affect the music properly. And so it was a good combination in that respect. And that's a result of that. You know? Well, that's, that's fantastic. Now, I understand the next step in your career is joining up with Carlos Santana, legendary uh, performer, mm -hmm. especially mm -hmm. after the Woodstock performance uh, of Soul Sacrifice, which uh, appears in the movie Woodstock. Uh, and uh, now he's a man on the rise, their band is on the rise, but they're looking for a drummer. Uh, I know they're a heavy percussion band, very Latin oriented type music. And uh, how do you end up making this connection with the great Carlos Santana? Well, it's a bit of an odd story. Uh, uh, it turned out that when I left Gino, um, I had moved to Los Angeles to live with the engineer that did Gino's record, uh, Tom Bakari. He was nice enough to put us up for a while. I worked a little bit around, but my visa ran out and I had to come back. And I started working with Don Triano, doing rehearsals for what would become an, an album for Donnie. And uh, one day I came back from those rehearsals. I was sharing a rooming house with friends on Hazleton Avenue, not far from the Guess Who studio, actually. And... Uh, Somebody took a message for me while I was at rehearsal and said, you need to call Bill Graham. And I said, Bill Graham, what Bill Graham? And they said, Bill Graham, you know, the Fillmore East and the Fillmore West, that Bill Graham. I went, yeah. And they said, no, he called while you were away. <laughs> I didn't believe it, right? You know, and the message was, call me right away. I've been looking for you for weeks now. Wow. And they couldn't track me down because I didn't really have a phone number that was, you know, I was staying with people. So I never, didn't have a permanent address there for a while. They found me. I called. The next day, they sent me a ticket to San Francisco. I got on the aircraft. I went down there and I was playing with San Francisco, uh, with Santana the next day. Now, I understand uh, there's some Congos there behind you. You yeah. played those in yeah. Santana? No, I, I didn't, but, but I love playing the congas, and I know some of the basic rhythms well enough to play. I, I, I learned congas, enough congas to be able to see how the drum set fit together with them. But no, I leave the con left the congas to them in the beginning, and I had a lot of learning to do, I realized, when I, when I started working with two other percussionists in that context. Well, you know, Carlo's legendary guy, as I said, and the performance yeah. at uh, Woodstock was, uh, gave us some taste of what the band was like. Now, I know you weren't there at Woodstock, but I got to ask you, how many times did you play Soul Sacrifice after you joined the band? Oh, oh, I can't hazard a guess. Uh, but it's also about how many times I was mistaken for Michael Shreve. Because I, I, looked a bit, I looked a bit like him with longer hair from a distance. Well, if up close, you'd realize we're not. And uh, I was also very inspired by Michael's performance. I watched that on the floor of my parents' living room on Rainbow Avenue in London East when they were on the Ed Sullivan show. 
-hmm. And I went, oh, I love that band. I really like what they were doing. Something about it really struck me. I had no idea that I would end up playing with that band. You know, that it's crazy how things can happen. That that is unbelievable to see them on Ed Sullivan, admire yeah. them, and then find out through the the steps of fate that you end up in that band. How many years were yeah. you with them? Oh, for a while there, I held the record for the longest tenured member. I think it was twelve years. Although I did come back to Canada for about a year and a half to two years to refresh a visa um, in the midst of that. And I lived in Mississauga for a couple of years. And I'd worked with Don Triano and some other artists in, in Toronto again during that period. But overall, it was about 12 years. I see some gold records behind you. What are those, Graham? Um, well, if I can turn around, okay. I mean, think if I can point it to properly. This yeah. one here, if all you can see the best, is Storm at Sunup right there. And that's the picture. Storm at Sun Up. The, the one to the side, I don't know if you can see it that well, is Powerful People. Oh. And there is one over there The is a platinum one from Australia, which is a double platinum album for Moonflower. And you worked with so many great uh, talents, and Jeff Emmerich is one of them. I mean, he, he would have been fresh off oh. of producing many of the Beatles, and uh -huh. uh, you're working with that guy. What was that like? Well, he was such a tremendous name. And honestly, I, 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 I didn't quite know that much about him because there was so much written about the, uh, and George Martin, yes, sorry, sorry, but he really worked with George Martin. So I wasn't that aware of Jeff Emmerich. When Gino and Joe came to me and said, well, we're going to go over to England. We're going to practice for a month at Ridge Farm in Surrey, which was a remote farm that a lot of, uh, uh, convert, but they converted the barn to a practice studio. So a lot of bands and musicians went there to prepare to record. Um, we stayed there for two weeks and we moved into the city, rented flats and recorded at, um, at Air Studios in Oxford Circus. You know, so it was like a dream come true almost. And then, then when they mentioned Jeff Emmerich's name and, and they said Beatles, uh, that was the first time I really clicked with me. I went, oh, wait a minute. The, the, he <laughs> engineered the Beatles. Okay. And he's going to put mics on my drum set. Okay. Oh, All that's right. beautiful. Beautiful. I just wish I had a photo of the drum set from that album. I don't have one. I wish oh, I had a photo bad. in the studio. Oh, you wouldn't have believed. Because I had two bass drums. Gina wanted to do two bass drums. And I had all kinds of tom-toms and mass amount of cymbals. And the mics that they got in there, it just looked like uh, it was a cacophony of stuff. It was incredible. Oh. I wish I had that shot. But uh, that was quite yeah. an experience. I know you wrapped up your career for many years performing with Paul Anka. And... Mm -hmm. uh, Paul Anka is a, a, he was a Canadian musical force to be reckoned with, but oh, yes. getting to the generation now that might forget his accomplishments. So I just want to say a couple words about him. Paul Anka was born in 1941, a Canadian singer, songwriter, and actor. He became famous with hit songs, including Diana, Lonely Boy, Put Your Head on My Shoulder, and You're Having My Baby. He wrote the theme for The Tonight Show, starring Johnny Carson. One of Tom Jones' mm -hmm. biggest hits, She's a Lady, and the English lyrics to uh, some other uh, albums here, uh, and also the music for Frank Sinatra's signature song, My Way, which has been recorded by many, including Elvis Presley. Three songs he co-wrote with Michael Jackson, This Is It, I Never Heard, and Love Never Felt So Good, and Don't Matter to Me became posthumous hits for Jackson. Diana, one of the biggest selling singles ever in Canada. Uh, how did you make the connection with Paul? Well, that was uh, interesting. That was through, uh, it's funny how networking works, right? In, in business and in music, and it's the same, and uh, for sure in music. And uh, a guitarist that worked with Gino Vanelli on and off, but wasn't a permanent member of the band, Joe de Blasi, was working with Paul Anka already on tour. And when the drummer came up and ended up the, the chair open because the drummer left to go elsewhere, he suggested that I do it. And... Uh, Awesome. I, I went and auditioned in Las Vegas and got the job and stayed there almost 25 years. Amazing. Graham, we're running out of time. Mm -hmm. uh, I know, oh, man. I know wow. it's, it's gone so Too fast. fast. There's, there's so much yeah. for us to talk about. I would love to do that. But in our final couple of minutes here, mm -hmm. we've already mentioned Mario Cercelli and his work with the London Music Hall of Fame. Uh, great guy doing great work, recognizing London musicians. Uh, very unique Absolutely. Hall of Fame. Do you have any words of inspiration that you can 
leave for Canadian uh, talent, London, Ontario talent that uh, is kind of struggling away like you living in the basement of houses here and there and just yeah. awaiting their big break. Uh, any words to share on that? Well, I can say that uh, one thing I did when I was younger and all through my life, really, it was uh, I, I carried a quote uh, from uh, by Winston Churchill, which success consists of going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. I wrote that on a piece of paper and I folded it up small and I put it in my wallet. Wow. And when I hit the hard times, I pulled it out. You know, so that's one thing I would say to kids coming up. But I mean, also, I mean, there's probably, you know, there, there's a, uh, three main things for me, I think, uh, if I look back on um, when I was struggling back in those days, and I would say foresight, preparation, and ambition, you know, were really big factors for me. And uh, later on in life, I, I try to live by the don'ts, and I would suggest that for anybody, for music or for life in general. And for me, the don'ts, don'ts are don't blame, don't lie, don't make excuses. And if you live by those, things are probably going to work out okay for you. Graham, thank you for yes. that. Thank you for those wise well, words. Uh, they hit home for all of us. And thanks for taking the time to speak to me for London Lights. It's been a real pleasure having you. You're a real gentleman. And uh, we're very proud of your accomplishments in the music world. So thanks again. This wraps up uh, episode three for season two of London Lights. Viewers stay with us for the next episode coming in a week or two. And Graham, thanks again. You take care of yourself. Thank you very much. Keep on drumming. Will do.